Welcome to our viewers around the world to our broadcast on Rebuilding Democratic Momentum. I'm Damon Wilson, President and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy. Let me start by thanking DJ Switch for the music you've been hearing. She's a civic leader from Nigeria, a Reagan Facel Fellow who is here with us at the Endowment, and you'll hear from her later in the program as somebody who embodies the spirit of why we've gathered today. She's also a great DJ. But we are gathered here on the eve of the Summit for Democracy. The voices of the NED, its family and its partners who you will hear from show our allies and our adversaries that we are united in our commitment to strengthening democracy around the world. Generating democratic momentum requires not only democratic unity and political commitments that the summit will feature this week, but as importantly, it requires supporting and unleashing the energy and innovation of frontline actors and activists around the world. And that is the daily work of the National Endowment for Democracy. So we see today's conversations as a launch of a campaign to renew democratic momentum and setting an agenda for the coming year of action. Ned board member Ann Applebaum recently warned that the bad guys are winning, quote unquote, calling new forms of globally networked authoritarianism, Democracy Inc and underscoring the, threat from, uh, underscoring the threat from transnational challenges to democracy. At the same time, Madeleine Albright, the chair of the National Democratic Institution, part of the NED family, who you will hear from shortly, also urged us in foreign affairs to see this summit as an opportunity for America and our democratic allies to lead the fight for new democratic renewal. Not out of naivete, but out of duty and a responsibility to set a North Star that can be seen around the world. We know we have to up our game. 
We have to have impact at scale. We have to innovate. Authoritarians are already doing so, and they are the ones who stand to benefit if we don't step up. So the pathway to a democratic renewal begins by supporting those on the front lines of the fight. Whether an anonymous blogger, an imprisoned human rights defender, or Nobel Peace Prize winning journalist, all under pressure from autocrats, or whether it is Ukraine or Taiwan or Hong Kong or the Uyghurs of East Turkestan who are at the epicenter of the fight for freedom today. We need to draw on the strength, resilience, and determination of courageous activists and political actors to regain our footing and to rebuild democratic momentum with a campaign built around democratic solidarity, support those for those on the front lines, and a commitment to act together in common cause. So with that, let's get on with our program. I am so pleased to start by sharing part of a conversation I was honored to have with Filipino journalist, journalist and founder of Rappler, Maria Ressa, on the global threat to democracy from disinformation, just days before she accepts this year's Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo on Friday. Maria has been a colleague and a friend to me in the endowment for years as she was out front identifying the threats to democracy and defending journalism under assault. She is a Ned grantee, a fighter, and a leader in a battle against disinformation and for free and independent media in the Philippines. Our conversation began by my asking how the Nobel Peace Prize she will accept on December 10th relates to her fight for press freedom. Uh, I think it's all connected. When we first started talking about this, it was a new weapon. There was a new weapon that was being used against journalists. And, uh, you know, when journalists come under attack, democracy is under attack. The Nobel Committee, I think, is spotlighting something that uh, that I've called kind of like this invisible atom bomb that it, that's exploded and it is in our information ecosystem. Damon, the last time a journalist was, was won this prize was in 1936, Karl von Osiecki, and, and he didn't get a chance to go to Oslo to pick up his award because he was languishing in a Nazi concentration camp. Right? So, so giving this award to journalists again this year, seems to be a signal that, you know, here we are again coming to another moment where over the last 15 years, you know, the number of journalists under attack have increased over the last decade. If you go to, to the, the World Press Freedom Index, um, conditions have just gotten worse for journalists trying to hold power to account. But I think the most important part, and we spent a lot of time talking about this, you and I, um, is the role of technology as the accelerant. And I'll go back again to the to the to the kind of connection to World War II and post World War II. Um, it seems to me like this is a sliding door moment for the world mm. that you know we take one path and we can save our democracy, and we take another path and we go further into a descent to fascism. The things that had happened to us in the Philippines in 2016. Our dystopia has become your dystopia. Uh, and that's, I think, what we're facing in the world. It is a world that has um, been dominated by technology, that where technology is insidiously manipulating us now has been allowed to do that. So I, I think part of this is why we're leaning in so much to the Summit for Democracy, because it is the defining challenge of a test between autocracy and democracy right now, fueled by technological innovations. But in many respects, as you said, the Philippines was really on the front end of this storm, if you will, a storm that's now engulfing much of the world. I called us the canary in the coal mine. Facebook itself called us uh, patient zero. Um, we were there in Berlin again where, when Katie Harbath and I had that discussion. Um, how did it begin? We were the guinea pigs and the target was you. Uh, why? Why the Philippines? Because this is the sixth year in a row that Filipinos have spent the most time online and on social media. Another factor, 100% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Facebook essentially is our internet. And, you know, the company I, I helped 
co-found in 2012, helped the rise of Facebook. We started on Facebook. I drank the Kool-Aid. I believed in social media for social good, social media for social change, because there is that possibility. And I haven't completely given up. We remain a Facebook fact-checking partner, one of two Filipino fact-checking partners. But look, as early as uh, I, I was able to corner the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Christopher Wiley, a, a few years ago, 2018 again, and, and um, Shortly after, after that, that broke, that story broke, um, he had told me that Cambridge Analytica and its parent company, SCL, had long been operating in the Philippines and that they tested these tactics of mass manipulation in countries like ours, where law enforcement is weak. They could test relatively with impunity and not be held accountable. So if the tactics of manipulation worked, they could then take it and poured it over to the West. So this is now, it's been more than five years, we can see the pattern and the trend. But I guess what isn't said often enough, because the public debate centers on content moderation, uh, it's down here. You sh we don't have to deal with content if we actually go to the root cause of the problem, which is way upstream here. It isn't about free speech or content. It's about algorithmic bias and algorithmic amplification. And I think the, the, the biggest problem still stems back to the United States, because by saying that these platforms are not liable for what they feed us, what they allow to taint the information ecosystem with, it has allowed this kind of um, information dystopia. And until that stopped, countries like mine in the Philippines, countries in the global south where institutions are weaker, are the most vulnerable. And that's frankly where you've seen the most violence. Let me bring us to a close with this. Just asking, this has not been an easy path for you. I mean, you've faced a lot of um, harassment, intimidation, um, really threats of, of violence you've had to bring in. Uh, considerable security to Rappler as well. What motivates you? What motivates you to, to fight this fight? I don't think I ever had a choice, right? I mean, I had no choice but to do what I do, but I'm also very lucky because I'm alive to still keep going. Uh, I am not in jail. There are many others who have, have it far worse than I do. And the best thing I could do is to give it my all because this moment matters. Maria, you drive home the agency of, of how much people, how much individuals matter, how much a passion uh, really can help change things. And you have inspired so many. We've been proud to work with you, Maria. Uh, we're going to be cheering you on in the coming days uh, as, as leaders gather for the summit. Uh, we're going to help all eyes are on you as you accept this uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Um, well-deserved, well-earned. Congratulations, and thank you for giving us a little bit of your time today. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So I want to encourage all of you who are watching to visit Ned's website to watch the full conversation where Maria offers a dazzling and daunting masterclass in the challenges of new technology for journalism and democracy. It's quite something to see. Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome to our main stage here and introduce Azrozea, Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, who will share a keynote remarks on the official summit for democracy in the coming year of action. Azra has been a friend and a champion of freedom throughout her career, and we're so pleased to have her with us today. Uh, the Secretary has been working uh, to tee up what is going to be an extraordinary summit over the next two days, and we look forward to her preview with us. So, uh, Madam Secretary, over to you. Thank you so much, Damon, um, for an inspiring opening and the opportunity to speak this afternoon. I'm deeply honored to be here to talk about the Biden administration's democracy renewal agenda. I want to start by thanking each of you here today for the work you do every day to protect and advance democratic values around the world. I'm especially glad to join you today as we kick off the Summit for Democracy, President Biden's signature democracy renewal event this year. 
We have a remarkable lineup of champions of freedom um, on the dais, the virtual dais today, including Secretary Albright and Senator Sullivan, former heads of state and Ned family leaders. In addition, I'm thrilled to be here virtually with this year's Nobel Peace Prize honoree, Maria Reza. Maria, thank you for the inspirational work you do to shine a light on abuses in the Philippines. You're a beacon to human rights defenders, women, youth, and journalists all over the world. And Maria and I share a very dear personal connection. Uh, my sister helped hire Maria at CNN many years ago, and it's been simply thrilling to watch your indispensable work over these last many years. So good to be with you all. As you all know, we're facing unprecedented challenges to democracy, both at home and abroad. Corruption, inequality, and the failure of many democratic governments to deliver for their citizens have fueled doubts about the democratic model and led to a rise of leaders who abandon or attack democratic norms. Authoritarian regimes advance false narratives of superiority while seeking to undermine our institutions, bolster opponents of democracy within our systems and discredit our values. These trend lines are exacerbated by the misuse of technology to spread disinformation, censor, and arbitrarily or unlawfully surveil, and erode public trust in democracy. Meanwhile, the international community is facing an extraordinary set of crises that know no borders, including the COVID-19 pandemic, racial inequality, record levels of forced displacement, and a deepening climate crisis. As President Biden has said, it is the challenge of our times to demonstrate that democracies can rise to these challenges and deliver for our citizens. We know that societies that respect and defend human rights, uphold the rule of law, and support inclusive, accountable governance are best equipped to produce durable solutions to even the most difficult problems. But some people in our societies, particularly persons of color and minorities, see a gap between what we promise and what we deliver. So we find ourselves in a moment of democratic reckoning. Autocrats offer their citizens the false choice between their freedom and their security and prosperity. The task before us as democracies is to deliver on the issues that matter most to our people while continually renewing and perfecting our respective democratic projects. While there's no shortage of challenges to our democracies, we have no doubt about the best way to tackle them. We must put these problems out into the open and work together to solve them. That's always been democracy's greatest strength, the power it provides to people to improve their societies and to work towards a more perfect union. With this in mind, President Biden has called for a global democratic renewal to galvanize action to reinvigorate democracies and demonstrate that they can deliver the best results for their people and the world. The Biden administration has been clear from day one on the imperative to center democratic values and human rights in our foreign policy. President Biden has also been clear from day one that America must be engaged bilaterally and multilaterally with partners across the spectrum who wanna work towards these foundational values on which our nation is built. To be leaders for democracy and human rights abroad, we must live up to these principles here at home. This is why President Biden has prioritized renewal of democracy here in the United States as well. On his first day in office, the president issued an executive order that requires all federal agencies to enforce prohibitions on, on discrimination based on sexual orientation and that once again allows transgender Americans to serve in our nation's military. On the same day, the president also issued an executive order for a comprehensive federal government approach to advancing equity for all, 
including people of color and historically underserved or marginalized populations. In addition, the recently enacted bipartisan infrastructure bill is bringing broadband internet to rural parts of our country so students can continue school online through COVID and providing urgent funding for public works projects to keep our roads and bridges safe. This is what democracies must do, deliver real results for our people. And this is what President Biden had in mind when he announced his intent to hold a summit for democracy during his first year in office. The summit this week is a kickoff event that brings together over a hundred democracies from every part of the globe, plus hundreds of civil society partners to reaffirm our commitment to democracy, find concrete ways to work together to address some of our toughest challenges and recommit to delivering for our citizens in ways that matter most for their lives. Because much work remains to be done in our own country, we approached this week's summit with humility, given the many continued challenges at home. But we also come with the confidence of having the will and the tools to improve our democracy. The summit is an invitation to fellow democracies to join that quest. This moment requires us to come together, learn together, stand together, and act together. The Summit for Democracy has three overarching goals. One, to defend against authoritarianism. Two, to elevate the fight against corruption. And three, to advance respect for human rights domestically and abroad. We've invited countries to share meaningful commitments, for example, supporting free independent public media as a counterweight to the spread of disinformation, combating illicit finance, and holding kleptocrats accountable, and supporting democratic reformers on the front lines of human, act, of human rights activism so they can continue their critical work. We are putting forward our own set of commitments as well. Internationally, these include galvanizing donors to support free media, launching complementary anti-corruption sanctions regimes to make corrupt actors pay a higher price for their illicit activities and ensuring that those on the front lines of often very dangerous work have the financial support they need to continue. Domestically, we expect the president will announce commitments across the three summit goals, including related to securing free and fair elections, restoring ethics and democratic norms in government, galvanizing civic engagement through the American Rescue Plan, fighting corruption through beneficial ownership regulations, and advancing equity and equality for all people, regardless of their race, sex, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. This year's summit also kicks off a year of action during which we'll partner with governments and civil society to turn commitments into concrete results. Next year, we wanna show that we've made progress on our commitments and that we're moving the needle in the right direction on our democracy renewal goals. The centerpiece of our year of action plan is a focused consultative process across the summit's pillars, co-led by governments and civil society that will bring summit participants together to deepen our collective action on commitments and identify new areas that need greater attention. We plan to launch champion cohorts to take on certain subsets of the summit's goals, and we'll look to governments and civil society partners to co-lead these cohorts with us. In addition to civil society, the Year of Action will also engage the private sector, which is a central role to play in driving prosperity while advancing our values and can be a powerful impetus for rule of law reform, anti-corruption efforts, and workers' rights. We look forward to working with the private sector to enhance human rights, in particular in the digital technology space, to ensure that technology is used as a tool to strengthen democracies 
and not as a weapon of repression used by authoritarians to silence their people. In closing, I'd like to once more thank the NED for convening today's session. And I look forward to working with all of you as we press forward on our important democracy renewal efforts. You've heard President Biden say this, but it's worth repeating. Democracy doesn't happen by accident. We have to defend it, fight for it, strengthen it, renew it. We look forward to doing so together. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Ken Wallach, Chairman of the Board of the National Endowment for Democracy. Welcome to this brief but important discussion on rebuilding democratic momentum on the eve of the Summit for Democracy. When the endowment was established by the US Congress 38 years ago, one of its unique characteristics and assets was its organizational framework and mission, which reflected many of our own democratic institutions. Institutions representing Democrats, Republicans, labor and business united in the common cause of democracy. The four core institutes as they have been called have established and developed deep and abiding relationships with their international counterparts. The International Republican Institute, the National Democratic Institute, the Solidarity Center and the Center for International Private Enterprise represent in effect American chapters of an international club of democratic institutions, leaders and activists who draw strength and learn from one another. The NED speaks of itself as a family disparate groups who share a common vision. And we are fortunate to have that family represented today by the leaders of the four core institutes. Since 2001, Secretary Madeleine Albright has chaired the National Democratic Institute. She is a scholar, professor, best-selling author, businesswoman, and diplomat who held two of the country's highest diplomatic posts. I would add that she also prides herself as once being a Capitol Hill and White House staffer. Since childhood, when her family twice escaped Czechoslovakia, her country of birth, democracy and freedom have been personal to her. Her doctoral dissertation and subsequent research examined democratic openings in Central and Eastern Europe, and her public and private lives have given concrete expression to her commitment to a more democratic world. In full disclosure, the secretary was my chairman for 18 years when I served as president of NDI. Dan Sullivan, the junior senator from Alaska, is the chairman of the International Republican Institute. He succeeds IRI's longtime chairman, John McCain. The senator has served in the US Marine Corps since 1993, both in active duty and in the reserves, and has served in both the Department of State as an assistant secretary and in the White House. He was attorney general of Alaska before entering the Senate where he sits on the Armed Services Committee. He is deeply committed to bipartisanship in US efforts to advance and sustain democracy and freedom globally and works closely with Secretary Albright to send that message both at home and abroad. The Senator and the Secretary share links to both the Department of State and Georgetown University where the Senator received his law degree and the Secretary teaches her popular course on diplomacy. From Poland and Tunisia to Zambia and South Africa, democratic movements have been led by trade unionists who benefited from the support they received from their American counterparts. Liz Schuler, the first woman to become president of the AFL-CIO, chairs Labor Solidarity Center. Ms. Schuler's meteoric rise in the labor movement began as a union organizer for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the IBEW. She was undoubtedly influenced by her parents. Her father, a union, uh, a union uh, uh, lineman, electrical lineman for Portland General Electric, and her mother worked among PGE clerical workers who were not unionized. It was only fitting therefore that Liz's first union effort fresh out of college was to organize clerical workers at the company where her parents worked. She eventually became the highest ranking woman in the IBEW. The Center for International Private Enterprise was founded on the principle that economic and political freedom 
are inexorably linked. Greg Lebedev serves as chairman of SITE, whose mission is to support free market institutions and economic reform. Mr. Lebedev is also a member of the board of directors of the US Chamber of Congress. Commerce. He has served in senior government positions in three administrations, at the United Nations, at the Departments of State and Defense, and at the White House. During his work at the chamber, he was its chief operating officer and executive vice president for international policy. He is widely known and respected for his expertise in corporate government. Thank you all for being here. Madam Secretary, can I begin with you? When it comes to global democracy trends, you have described yourself as an optimist who worries a lot. Your 2018 book, Fascism, A Warning, undoubtedly was an expression of those worries. Yet your recent article in Foreign Affairs Magazine predicted a democratic revival, certainly reflecting your optimism. Can you explain your more upbeat assessment and what do you see that would give us all greater hope? Well, first of all, Ken, I'm delighted to be a part of this discussion, not only with you, but with uh, my good friend, Senator Sullivan and Liz Schuler and Greg Lebedev, and to really uh, talk about how terrific an organization this is. And now with Damon Wilson there, I think uh, there are all kinds of possibilities and uh, looking forward to our further work. Well, let me tell you how I came to all this, because first, the sense of complacency among those who care most about democracy has disappeared. And with it, what I would really call the unrealistic euphoria that took hold when the Berlin Wall fell and alarms about freedom's future are spreading far and wide. So a challenge cannot be met until it's recognized and small D Democrats are well aware that we are in for a hell of a fight, to just to put it very clearly. And then, then my theory uh, that I wrote about is that second, it's easier to move upward uh, from a valley than from a peak. So despite our current distress, the globe is still far freer now than it was during the first five decades uh, of, of my life. We Democrats have an enlarged platform from, from which to mount a revival. And third, I think it is right to say that the rise in authoritarianism over the past two decades has taken place against the background of uh, international terrorism. The 2008 global financial meltdown, the Syrian civil war, a global refugee crisis, uh, a worldwide public health catastrophe. And these events stoked popular fears and frustrations and even panicked with uh, blame settling largely on elected leaders. So the next 20 years can hardly be uh, less conducive to democratic growth than the last, which is kind of a weird way to be optimistic at the moment. But anyway, the fourth, I think, and this is important to point out, that I really do think China and Russia have squandered their best opportunity that they might have ever had to offer a convincing alternative uh, to liberal democracy. Uh, between 2017 and 2020, the United States was missing in action and Europe was preoccupied with Brexit and, and other kind of uh, intramural uh, disputes. And the stage was set for Beijing and Moscow to present themselves as global models. And I would just say they failed. Uh, fifth, some of the forces that have fueled the rise of demagogues are undermining the staying power of authoritarian regimes, uh, now old enough to embody, believe it or not, the status quo. And there's a limit for how long an autocrat can sustain popularity simply by comparing himself now to a despised predecessor. So I think that um, they're really, uh, you know, in Russia, for instance, Putin is rarely contrasted anymore with poor Boris Yeltsin. In Venezuela, few really remember the ineffectual civilians 
who governed before Chavez, uh, Nicaragua's Ortega can hardly justify his broken promises by pointing to Somoza and Orban and Erdogan uh, have both been in power too long to escape responsibility for the sad state of, of their country. So finally, I really do think, and it's important, especially now to make this clear, we have a US president that is prepared to engage on democracy's behalf as is evident uh, by the Summit for Democracy. So that is why I am basically an optimist, but I do worry that we might miss some of the signals. Ben's on mute. I'm sorry, I just unmuted myself. Um, just a quick follow-up, uh, Madam Secretary. With our own democratic challenges, how do you respond to critics at home and autocrats abroad who might claim that the US has no influence or standing or credibility to advance democracy globally? Well, uh, I believe that we do have credibility. We are the world's oldest democracy, but we're also dealing with the issues. We're having a discussion. Uh, and I think we are approaching this with humility, understanding that things have not gone the way that we would have liked in the last couple of years, that we need to really think about how to go about this. Nothing's gonna happen easily. Uh, and I know, Ken, we talked about this, that we're been various times when we were in Egypt, for instance, that an Egyptian member of parliament came up to me and said, uh, after I had suggested that they try compromise and coalition building, and he said, you mean like you guys? So we're not always the best example. But I do think that now, if we put our mind to it and pick up some of the thoughts that I had in my earlier remarks, I hope that that will be kind of a, a way of uh, really uh, pushing us into thinking about what democracy is about and that democracy is not a spectator sport. Um, I don't know if you can see the pin I have on today, but it says, we the people. Uh, and that is what this country is about. And we the people need to really have our voices heard. Thank you. Senator, uh, what do you see as the role of the U.S. Congress, the government at large, and groups like IRI and NDI in contributing to positive change globally? And does the behavior of malign actors led by China and Russia pose a real and present danger to democratic progress globally? And how do we and our democratic allies respond? Well, Ken, thank you for the question, and, and I want to just begin by thanking everybody on the panel. It's great to be here with the, the Ned family and all the different counterparts, and Madam Secretary, always good to see you, um, and it's great to be with you again. And, and Liz, I, I, I just wanted to mention very quickly, we have something in common. My, my great-grandfather was one of the co-founders of the IBEW, of the whole union. I'm sure if you look at your history books, you'll see Frank J. Sullivan in there very prominently. Um, so we, we have a lot to talk about in that regard as well. But wow. um, Ken, look, I, I think uh, what Secretary Albright just mentioned are the areas in which I think it makes a lot of sense to focus. But to be realistic, there's no doubt that democracy has been in retreat for a whole number of reasons but we know where most of the challenges emanate from, as your question that you posed uh, indicates, and that's Russia, and that's in particular, in my view, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, led by Xi Jinping. So the good news is, I think that more than ever, there is bipartisan support in the Congress for the Ned family, and what we're doing, there's bipartisan support for initiatives like what President Biden is doing right now with the Summit of Democracies, which I commend him and his whole team for doing. 
and there's bipartisan support to uh, really recognize that the 21st century, the biggest 21st century challenge that um, our country faces is the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. And we've been here before. Uh, you know, we know as a country uh, how to put together long term strategies. If you look at the strategy of containment after World War II, as the Soviet Union challenge presented itself. And I would say that the Chinese Communist Party's greatest fear is a long term, sustainable, bipartisan strategy addressing the challenges they pose. That is happening. That is happening. I can say that with 100% confidence, certainly in the United States Senate, among Democrats and Republicans. Let me just mention one other area that I think is an opportunity, as Secretary Albright mentioned. These countries, we know one of their biggest um, vulnerabilities is they fear their own people. They fear their own people. Putin and Xi Jinping wake up every day nervous about what's happening in their own country with their own people. That is a vulnerability that we certainly don't have. It, it causes them, you may have seen, uh, in response to the summit that the president is putting on, China put out its own paper on democracy, claiming that they're a democracy. 51 pages, no offense of a bunch of malarkey here, on the great democracy in China. Why does that matter? Because they feel that they have to go to their people and say, well, well we, we are a democracy. Well, they're not, of course, they're a dictatorship. So these are the kind of vulnerabilities that both Democrats and Republicans are working on together. And I think uh, to the secretary's point, at least my time in the Senate, which is just a little under seven years, the change has happened in the last six years to focus on this issue together uh, as Americans, has been really uh, startling, impressive, and important. And I think we're on, we're on our way to establishing a long-term, sustainable, bipartisan strategy to deal with these challenges. And that's what our nation needs. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Ms. Schuler, Mr. Lebedev, um, the roles of labor and business in this mission are sometimes overlooked but certainly not by the NED. What are your respective roles in defending democracy and helping to make de democracy deliver? And how can both institutes working with your friends internationally work to advance anti-corruption efforts that will certainly be a centerpiece at tomorrow's Summit for Democracy? Uh, Liz first. Great. Um, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, and I am so thrilled to join my fellow panelists uh, and the NED family today for this critical discussion. And I just have to thank the NED because um, the incredible work that the NED's done over so many years, um, standing up for human rights and democracy around the world, uh, the mission is more important now than ever. Working people de depend on you. So, so thank you. Um, for context, the AFL-CIO is America's labor unions. We are a federation of 57 different unions, 12 and a half million working people in every industry and in every sector of the economy, in every state, um, from Senator Sullivan's great state of Alaska uh, to Florida and everywhere in between. Um, and then through our work at the Solidarity Center uh, and the AFL-CIO, we know that stable democracies depend on what we call a basic social contract. And that's that people share in the progress and have a voice in shaping their democracies. Um, we know now the world is three times richer than it was just 20 years ago, but hundreds of millions of working families have been left out of those gains. Um, for example, 70% do not have access to social protection. 84% uh, of people surveyed around the world say that the minimum wage that they live, in, they live off of is not enough to make ends meet. 
And in 2020, COVID-19 was devastating, as we know, economically. And working people lost the equivalent of 255 million jobs. Think about that. So unions can be a solution to these economic disparities. And unions are what we say is the most powerful vehicle for change, the, you know, to change the rules that have left so many working people poorer, less secure, more disenfranchised. Um, and unions are a powerful force for democracy because um, freedom of association, uh, a worker's right to organize and strike, these are fundamental to a democratic society and it gives people um, a mechanism to fight back against authoritarianism. So we all know that a healthy democracy uh, depends on democracy at the ballot box and in the workplace. And it relies on laws and rules that guarantee economic opportunity, equity and inclusion and economic equity and inclusion depend on freedom of association in the labor movement. And so that's why in the United States, we need to pass the PRO Act of Protecting the Right to Organize Act and the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act. Um, and it, at this very moment in many places around the world, um, people are disenfranchised and autocracy is winning. But civil society, the labor movement in particular, was born for this moment. And we exist to defend human dignity and expand human rights in the face of oppression and inequality. So look, we know in the history of progress, no government ever woke up one moment and you know magically expanded human rights. We know that. All our gains come from the collective action of people. Uh, people coming together to demand change. And just a few quick examples of the labor movement on the forefront of so many of the world's democratic movements. Of course, the independent labor movement that helped bring about democracy in Poland. We all remember that. Uh, auto workers organizing in Brazil sparked a movement and helped end authoritarian rule and usher in democracy. And unions were an essential part of the brave South African people's fight to end apartheid. And for the role they played in leading the revolution in Tunisia during the Arab Spring, the labor movement there was honored with the Nobel Peace Prize, okay? So the legitimacy of governments comes from the people. And the role of the labor movement is to demand democracy that delivers for working people and for everyone. And through workplace democracy, that gives workers a voice on the job and then brings the opportunity for collective bargaining that raises wages. And then the power of collective advocacy in the streets, in the halls of parliaments uh, around the world, you know, this is the goal. Um, that makes democracy real and it delivers for real people in their communities. Thank you, Liz. Um, Greg? Thank you, Ken. And I too am delighted to be here. And, and I, should, I should add, as we said at the top, I think all of us are thrilled that Damon is, is leading the NED and its initiatives. And uh, we think that's such a positive sign for, for the hard tasks that we have all going forward. We talk a lot about democracy uh, and defending democracy when we in fact should be focused upon advancing democracy or, or more specifically advocating for the free enterprise system anywhere in the world because it's inextricably linked to democratic governance. I, I'm afraid to say that when we talk about democracy, we can get a little lazy. Uh, our habit is to discuss it in a philosophic fashion uh, as a lofty concept with uh, aspirational attributes. However, we should take the harder path, the path that the Ned family takes and begin to appreciate and implement the less elegant, but more important ingredients of democracy, the stuff it takes to make the concept a reality. And it's that understanding that leads us, SIP and the business community to acknowledge that for democracy to exist and flourish, we must accept that we live in a new era in which democracy is not just led by governments, 
which can be ham-handed or heavy-handed. Uh, to be successful today, democracy must be built upon inclusive and innovative discourse and advocated and embraced throughout a society. And any conversation about how a city or a province or a country should operate must be enlarged beyond public officials to include the most practical and effective voices within a society. And that's usually the private sector and its stakeholders. More simply said, democracy is a function of the relationship between business and government. Uh, we're conjoined. We need each other, uh, even though we hate to admit it. Uh, a robust free market economy lubricates a society and permits democracy to exist as no other condition can. As we regularly witness, frail countries with fragile economies are places where democracy is in decline and too few governments recognize that to cure its economic ills and begin to repair its democratic institutions, it must enable and encourage the only engine it has, private enterprise. These are the uncomfortable lessons. On too many occasions, it's a government's tendency to act without expertise, to fail to appreciate that free market capitalism is the answer to its economic woes, not the culprit. But for business and labor to do its job for any society, there must exist those old fashioned ingredients of democracy, the rule of law, accountable public governance, citizen engagement, political participation, gender equity, and a common concern for ethical conduct and environmental stewardship. In other words, an environment conducive to business success. So it's an inescapable truth that business and government must be partners, not adversaries, if democracy is to survive. Each must recognize and enable their respective roles. The government's job is to create a, a, an, an, an ecosystem for enterprise which strikes a balance between necessary regulations and the freedom to operate and establishes the framework within which the private sector and the free enterprise system can do those things which only it can, create opportunities for meaningful labor, compete ethically, provide sustainable uh, services, generate revenue, and be both innovative and charitable. In short, serve as the economic platform for democratic governance. The lesson that must be learned over and over is that, is that a healthy free market economy is the fiber that holds democratic societies together. And it's the private sector, big and small, that helps guarantee that the hard work of, demo of democracy delivers for all the citizens. That's why we're here today. And I too applaud the president for his emphasis on global democracy. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, we're, we're gathered here on the eve of um, a summit at which more than 100 countries are participating. Can I ask each of you in your concluding remarks, what you hope can come from this gathering and not just from the meeting itself, but from the year of action called for in 2022. Uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, yes, thank you. It's very interesting having looked at the program uh, and what they have planned for the next few days. What they have done is put together, I think, the group of stakeholders in democracy. So obviously the political parties and the leaders, but also the private sector, the public sector, the, uh, the role of labor, uh, various parts of how our countries uh, operate internally and motivate uh, that kind of openness so that there is a discussion among the various stakeholders. Uh, it is not, there are speeches and things being given and will be. Uh, there also obviously are ways that uh, people can have smaller, uh, either virtually or in person discussions. But I was really struck by the fact of these, uh, of describing the, the various parts of the program as stakeholders, uh, because I think that that is something uh, that is important to recognize how many parts of our systems uh, re require participation by, uh, by others. Uh, for democracy to deliver, the various parts have to do their share. And so I think it also shows that President Biden has understood uh, the importance of democracy uh, having to be 
a leader uh, and a, uh, an important part of what is going on in the world, that there's this summit uh, and then there will be follow on on this. So this is not just a one time uh, shot at this. Uh, and I know that the National Democratic Institute is looking at a variety of ways where changes have to take place. So I think it's a very important, uh, uh, I think, spur to get us thinking about what democracy is really about. Thank you. Senator Sullivan. Is the Senator here? Yep, Ken, there you go. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, oh, thanks, Ken. Ken. Um, I think one of the most important things that can come out of this summit and going into the year of action is a very simple principle that democracies need to recognize that we have to stick together. Of course, we compete across a whole host of areas, economically, um, uh, certainly, but we need to recognize, and I think this uh, summit will help do this, that we are binded together by certain core principles. And um, we also need to recognize that they're particularly vulnerable members of our democratic community globally. I think one of the things that when we look back on the last few years that I think a lot of countries are gonna regret is just how muted the world's democracies were when the Chinese Communist Party essentially moved in to crush Hong Kong. We cannot allow that to be a lesson that they think they can take to other places, particularly uh, with regard to Taiwan. Uh, the United States has legal obligations with regard to the Taiwan Relations Act. And I think that we also need to recognize that Taiwan is not some um, uh, peripheral issue as it relates to democracies in the world, but in many ways is the front line of the distinction between democratic societies and authoritarian ones. Similar to West Berlin in the 20th century, uh, I think Taiwan plays that role for the 21st century. And I think to the extent that the democratic family around the world can continue to highlight that country and the pressure it's under and make sure that the Chinese Communist Party did not um, learn the wrong lesson in its actions with regard to Hong Kong, I think that's gonna be an enormously important issue. If Taiwan is taken over militarily, that will change the entire trajectory of the 21st century. In many ways, um, if you look at historical analogies, the, ways, the way the guns of August in 1914 changed the trajectory of last century. We need to recognize that and we need to come together, all of us, to be ready for that. Thank you. Uh, Liz Schuler. Sure. Um, well, we just co-hosted a um, another site event yesterday with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, uh, labor unions, labor ministers from around the world, um, along with uh, several U.S. government agencies. And we all collectively recommitted to the fight for democracy around the world and specifically the rights of workers. And so that's what I would hope would come out of the summit itself. Uh, because we want to see a people-centered foreign policy that, that prioritizes human rights and human well-being and that challenges um, the systems that are producing wealth and income inequality and that are disenfranchising people. Uh, we want to see democracy at the core of global development, you know, the agenda um, that, that we're pursuing and that um, fundamental work, worker rights are part of that agenda. Um, so just to put a fine point on it, do you know um, the world's most frequently violated set of human rights? Do you know what, what they are? It's labor rights. 
And I'm just going to tick through a couple of quick findings from the um, International Trade Union Confederation has a, a global rights index. And so the rights index for 2021 ranked 149 countries on the degree of respect for workers' rights. And they found that 87% of countries violated the right to strike. 79% uh, of countries violated the right to collectively bargain. 74% uh, of countries excluded workers from the right to establish or join a trade union. And the number of countries that denied or constrained workers' freedom of speech increased from 56 in 2020 up to 64 in 2021. And workers experienced arbitrary arrests and detentions in 68 countries. Trade unionists were murdered in six countries, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Myanmar, Nigeria, and the Philippines. So I say this because, and this has all gotten worse, of course, during the pandemic. So we hope that the year of action that's coming out of this summit, there will be some concrete follow-ups, uh, you know, and a construction of a just and inclusive democratic future for working people, that, that social contract that I talked about that ensures workers' rights, jobs with minimum living wages and collective bargaining, uh, universal social protection, quality public services, fair taxation, gender and racial equity, uh, and of course, social dialogue that supports uh, real just transition for climate and technology, the jobs that we'll, we're going to be um, transitioning. So none of these ideas, of course, is remotely even possible without defending open societies, civic freedoms, civic space, strong uh, civil society, and universal human rights. Uh, and so I would just say that the Solidarity Center will continue our work in the 70 countries uh, around the world that we, we're, we work in, uh, in solidarity with the NED family and with the world's workers and the democracy movement to make sure that this future that we all want becomes a reality. Thank you, Liz. And I'm, I'm sure that Senator Sullivan's grandfather would be very proud that your beginnings started at the IBEW. Absolutely. So, uh, Greg? The, I would hope that, th that at a minimum three things sort of come out of this year. The first that, as we all know, the democratic movement globally can, can wax and wane. And so I hope that this emphasis will really energize that movement and, and, and breathe life into something that's a, that, that's a serious initiative. Second thing, uh, I would hope sort of echoing what you all have said in one way or another, I would hope that it, that it serves to spotlight the real threats to democracy. We, we can look past many of these things for a variety of reasons. And I think, uh, I think the time might have come that we looked them in the eye. Uh, the third and, and final thought is that the year of action, whatever we wanna call it, might even galvanize us at home to rally around the idea in a bipartisan way uh, the need to aggressively confront these global threats uh, and to uh, uh, shape a, a bipartisan policy that, that leans forward uh, as we come to grips with some of these things that is, as all of us have said, are, are absolute and, and genuine threats to, to uh, what we know to be liberal democracy. Thank you, Greg. Um, Secretary Albright, Senator Sullivan, uh, Chairman Lebedev and President Schuler, thank you for your insights and for all you do to make the world a more peaceful, democratic, and prosperous place. Uh, I will now turn this over to Ned's Vice President, Jody Herman, who will lead a conversation on meeting authoritarian challenges. Uh, thank you all. I'm very excited to introduce the next segment. We've brought together bipartisan leaders from the United States Congress with Democratic activists from Russia, Nicaragua, Hong Kong, and Nigeria for brief conversations, rather like short TED Talks for democracy. Senators Jean Shaheen, Rick Scott, Ben Sass, and Representative Karen Bass 
share a commitment to holding authoritarian regimes accountable. Through the power of their offices and legislative actions, they stand by, support, and elevate the voices of activists who are leading initiatives for freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. In these brief conversations, Vladimir Karamuza of Russia, Berta Valle from Nicaragua, Nathan Law from Hong Kong, and DJ Switch from Nigeria will talk about their work and America's role in advancing freedom. Vladimir, it's nice to see you again, um, even by Zoom. It was great to see you in person up in Halifax um, about a week and a half ago. And, you know, as I was watching you on the panel talking about what was happening in Europe and with Russia and everything that you have sacrificed to continue to do what you're doing to provide an opposition to Vladimir Putin, um, one of the things that I thought about is just how, how you deal with all those challenges and what particularly in defense of human rights you're seeing and how we, can, how we can do better about addressing what Putin is doing and what you're facing. Thank you for your question and your, and your kind words. Um, it's, it's sort of strange for me to think about it uh, in terms of you know, how we do this and, and what's the motivation and what keeps us going because frankly, um, that's not even a question that comes to mind normally. How could we not do this? Uh, this is our country, we care about our country and we think our country deserves better, frankly, than to uh, be living in the 21st century under the yoke of an authoritarian kleptocratic, kleptocratic dictatorship. Needless to say, uh, you know, political change in Russia can and should, and if I may add, will one day um, come from the Russian people themselves. It cannot be any other way. And you know, we have seen what's been happening in Russia over the past year, even the hundreds of thousands of mostly young people who have been demonstrating all over the country, uh, literally from the Baltic Sea to the Pacific Ocean, uh, in protest of the arrest of Alexei Navalny, in protest of the uh, kleptocratic dictatorial regime of Vladimir Putin. So change in Russia is coming. Things are not going to remain forever the way they are today. Um, and again, it's only for us Russians to change the situation in our country. What we do hope to see from our friends and partners in the international community uh, is that you stay true to your own principles, uh, is that you stand on the same values that your own systems domestically are based on when it comes to international affairs as well. I cannot tell you how disappointing and disheartening it is uh, for us, those of us who are in opposition to Putin's regime in Russia and having to live with everything that we're living with uh, from political repression to political assassinations or attempted assassination to hundreds of political prisoners uh, to violent disperses of peaceful demonstrations that the whole world has witnessed how disheartening and disappointing it is to see Western leaders or Western politicians, uh, you know, welcome Putin with wide open arms, give him red carpet treatment, shake his hand, call him a friend and partner and so on and so forth. But even more disheartening uh, is to see Western countries essentially allowing Putin's kleptocracy to use them, to use the West um, as havens for the wealth that they are looting from the people of Russia. Uh, because the way this regime uh, operates, the way Putin's regime operates, is that these people uh, want to steal in Russia, but then go and spend and stash away that stolen money in Western banks, Western jurisdictions, Western financial institutions, and so on. I was in Georgia last summer with um, a bipartisan delegation when we got, actually it was in Ukraine, when we got word that um, Putin had shut down um, Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe in Moscow. And the reporters had fled to Kyiv in Ukraine. And we met with them to talk about how important it is to have uh, freedom for reporters to tell the truth about what's happening. How do we develop a democracy? A democracy is not possible without a free press who can report on what's happening. And so that's another area that we've really got to look at. And you talk about the financial um, situation. It's something that we've been talking about here in Congress because as you point out, if we allow Putin and other oligarchs to make money through corruption off of the Russian people and then store that money in safe Western banks and financial institutions, it reinforces the ability that they have to steal that money 
And we've got to stop doing that. We can't let that happen. And whether it's through Magnitsky sanctions or other measures, the financial systems in the West have got to take a stronger stand on allowing that kind of money into the system. My question to you is that uh, I notice that every time um, a member of the United States Senate, including yourself, comes out in support of um, an initiative that relates to democracy and human rights internationally. Uh, there is a sort of a flurry of commentators, especially now on social media, it's really easy to flood people with negative comments. Uh, and a lot of people ask the question, oh, you know, why do you care about that? Why do you care about what's happening somewhere in a faraway land? Deal with your own problems, deal with your own, you know, constituency. Well, you talked about our values and our values are what makes America such a great country. And the values that we represent in the United States are a very important symbol for the rest of the world. And if we're not willing to support um, human rights around the world, then how can we stand up for human rights at home? So it is very important. And as you say, it's very important that we speak up, that we have our voices heard, because it does matter. Hi, uh, this is Rick Scott. I'm a senator from the great state of Florida. Human rights, uh, democracy, freedom, uh, peace in Latin America is very important to so many people that, that live in my state. Berta, the biggest thing I want to say is thank you for what you do every day. And I wish you the best as you fight for human rights, for freedom, liberty, and peace in Nicaragua. First, Bernie, if you could tell us some of the challenges you're facing in Nicaragua. Thank you, Senator Scott, for your words and your support. And thank you for your question. Nicaragua, sadly, is no longer a democracy, but a dictatorship. In the last year, President Daniel Ortega has solidified his role in the country by passing repressive laws, disqualifying all credible opposition parties, eliminating independent media, and closing civic space. Most shocking is that Ortega disappeared and detained more than 40 opposition leaders, journalists, and activists, including the seven leading presidential candidates. One of them, my husband, Felix Maradiaga. Felix was called to the public ministry on June 8 and was disappeared by Nicaraguan's National Police for 84 days. Their trials now have been suspended, so they remain detained indefinitely and held incommunicado for weeks at a time. With all of the opposition in prison, the Ortega regime held the so-called election on November 7. And Daniel Ortega proclaimed himself president for the fourth consecutive term. After six months of arrest and disappearance, the Nicaraguan people live every day in fear Six months ago, we were facing severe challenges to our democracy, but now we have seen what happens when the world fails to take strong actions, that democracy can be lost and became a dictatorship. So what actions can be done to support um, the fight for freedom and democracy in Nicaragua? There is much that the international community can do to support Nicaraguan people as we fight to restore democracy and human rights to our country. First, democracies must continue to demand the immediate and unconditional release of more of the more of 170 political prisoners in Nicaragua, including my husband, Felix Paradiaga. Second, democracies throughout the world must take coordinated action to respond to Daniel Ortega's stealing of the November 7 elections where no opposition candidates was even allowed to appear in the ballot. The international community has condemned the election as illegal, but after January 10th, Daniel Ortega will be an illegitimate president and the international community must refuse to recognize him. Third, democracy should demand new, fair and transparent election to be held immediately and let me just conclude with, with one broader and critical point. The strongest dictatorship of the world, such as China, Russia, and Iran, are working strategically and intentionally to support weaker regimes like Venezuela, Cuba, Syria, and Nicaragua. 
with money and tools to maintain their grip on power. Unless the democracies of the world come together and make major investments to challenge these global systems, not just in developed regimes one at a time, I think there is no way that we can prevail. Senator Scott, um, I can't emphasize how important it is for the United States to stand with people who are sick in democracy and human rights around the world. It is this kind of support that gives us courage to face serious threats to our lives and liberty. Why do you feel the US must and how should it best help lead the world in supporting the, democr uh, the democratic aspirations of people suffering under authoritarianism regimes? I think, I think that first off, if the United States doesn't lead, no one's gonna help us. If the United States doesn't focus on what's going on in Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, I mean, nobody else is going to do anything about it. So one, every everybody in the United States, every leader, everybody that has a pulpit needs to be very vocal. We've got to demand uh, in no uncertain terms the release of all pol political prisoners. we got to demand new free and fair elections. We need to do the exact same thing in Cuba and, and, and Venezuela. Um, we've, got to, we've got to humanize uh, the, the situation, uh, talk about exactly what's happening to your family and other families. We've got to talk about what's happening to the citizens. And then on top of that, we've got to sanction. We've got to quit allowing uh, or take it, have it, any resources. We need to do the same thing with Cuba and, and Venezuela. Make sure these thug dictators don't have any resources to be able to uh, take away rights against their citizens. Thank you, Senator. And, and thank you also for your support and, and your voice. What message would you like to send to civic activists and freedom fighters like me and my colleagues in Nicaragua? A pueblo de Nicaragua, no están solos. Estoy con ustedes en esta lucha. Florida está con ustedes en esta lucha. Los Estados Unidos están con, están con ustedes en esta lucha. Juntos veremos un nuevo día de libertad para Nicaragua, Cuba y Venezuela. The big thing uh, going forward is always tell me what you think I can be doing um, because I'm, I'm dedicated to making sure in Nicaragua and Venezuela, Cuba and all across Latin America and anywhere I can have an influence around the world that people get to live in the same freedom that we all want to live in in this country. Nathan, thank you uh, for taking time with me and with us. And thank you more importantly for the work that you do, both on behalf of a lot of people that you and we care about, um, but also just as a model for the world of somebody who's fighting for human dignity. So why don't, why don't we start there? Um, can you tell us how you're continuing the fight for freedom and, and for the rule of law in Hong Kong um, at a time that is so dark and ugly? How, how are you keeping the faith, recognizing that so many people have already been driven into exile or, or spent time in jail? Thank you so much for the question, Senator and your continuous support to the Hong Kong movement. In 2014, I led the um, civil disobedience movement, umbrella movement, and the government prosecuted me with um, a charge of inciting an authorized assembly. At first, I was uh, given community service at the first case, first court. Um, but eventually the government kept pursuing, keep um, reviewing my charge until um, mm -hmm. at the court of appeal, they overturned that and put me in jail for eight months. And then I served a, a couple of, a couple months of it and I appealed, I successfully appealed at that. But at the end of the day, it really showed how the government wanted to weaponize the legal system to prosecute democratic um, campaigners and then put them in jail where if you're in jail, well, there's uh, very few things that you can do because it's a place that you can never seek help from the external world. Your, your exemplary courage through all this has been an encouragement to many of us, um, even as we've grieved with you during your suffering. What, what, what can um, democracies do in the coming year to support people like you that are facing uh, the growing authoritarian threat that we see from the CCP? I think um, democracies have to stick together. We have to find ways to hold these human rights perpetrators accountable. What I found um, is difficult and is troubling is that we have welcomed them in, for the past few decades into our international system, but we have not been able to come up with mechanism to hold them accountable when things go wrong. And I think this must change. We have to develop mechanisms. And if we look at the economic mass of um, democracies coming together, we're more than half of the global economy 
and we've got a lot of um, NGO um, sectors and also a lot of knowledge in how we can come up with mechanism that can stop these numerous perpetrators on the one hand, repaying all the economic benefits in, uh, in this globalized system, but also continuing uh, the agenda of the dismantling democracy, uh, undermining our free values and keep docking people in jail or even in concentration camps. Um, so Senator, um, uh, when this um, summer of democracy ends, we've got a year long of actions. What do you think um, that we can do that are the most powerful tools um, to, to hold these perpetrators accountable and also support human rights uh, defenders in Asia? Well, I mean, obviously there need to be um, real tools that are hard as well. Um, but I do believe the pen and the word and truth telling are one of the most fundamental things that we need to continue to hold to in this time. Freedom is never free. It's never easy. Uh, it's never the default. Freedom is something that has to be secured and then protected because the wilderness grows back because we live in a broken world. So freedom depends on Nathan Laws of the world. It depends on men and women who stand up and tell the truth. And it's clear that the, the Chinese Communist Party is shameless. They, they peddle lies and they just hope the rest of the world will be too lazy, uh, too short-term focused and too squeamish to tell the truth. And so we, we, can't, we can't let that happen. So I do genuinely believe that the single strongest tool we have is telling the truth over and over again, relentlessly in the face of their lies. And I think the U.S., um, needs to lead a coalition of freedom-loving nations that believe in, in trade and in commerce of, of, of goods, but especially of ideas, that believe in the open navigation of the seaways, that believe in the rule of law, that believe in transparent contracts, that believe in human rights. Um, we need a, a coalition of nations that believe fundamentally in the kind of human dignity that you've been fighting for. Well, thank you so much, Senator. These are really powerful suggestions, and I um, on behalf of a lot of Hong Kong people, thank you so much for your um, introduction of the legislation and everything that you have been doing for freedom and for human rights defenses around the world. We need to continually tell folks um, in, in Hong Kong, in, in China, um, in, in the US and in every other country across the world that the story of Hong Kong and the Chinese Communist Party is really a story of courage on one side and cowardice on the other. Thank you for all that you do and please let us know how we we can assist you. Um, you've got a lot of people who are praying for you, um, who are empathizing with you and want to know what we can do uh, to lift our, lift our hands and lift our voices um, to raise you and your courage high. Nathan, we're proud yeah. of you. Thank you so much, Santa. Thank you. Well, DJ, it is wonderful to be here with you today. And uh, I have so many questions for you, but why don't I start by asking you to tell us about the challenges facing democracy in Nigeria. When Nigeria returned to, demo like to democratic rules about 21 years ago, I thought of a just and egalitarian society was believed to accompany this democracy, right? And so there was much optimism. Unfortunately, we've been riddled with challenge after challenge, most of which we as a nation should be uh, ashamed to call a challenge in 2021. So I only mentioned a few. Um, number one, human rights abuse. This is prevalent in Nigeria, not only as a creative, who's an activist or to human rights defenders, the average Nigerian suffers abuse on all levels from security forces or government officials to friends of these people. Anyone is literally a potential victim of human rights abuse in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Number two, corruption. Political elites since the independence have um, used politics as an avenue for wealth accumulation and power, and they will do anything to get it and keep it. This is truly a do or die affair and has brought not only violence, but inflation, insecurity, I could go on. Three, I'd like to mention electoral reform. It's a big one. The uh, lack of reform or refusal, I would say, is a significant issue facing democratic governance in Nigeria. The chaotic electoral system only favors the political parts as they are dependent on that chaos in order to rig elections and so on. So this is particularly a present challenge to democracy in Nigeria which also gives life to human rights violation, insecurity, which is a whole nother challenge on its own, poverty, ethnic divide. And just to touch on poverty real quick, that I like to always accompany with a lack of education that has been weaponized. Unfortunately, this is an effective tool against the masses where people will take anything just to get by. I'm listening to you, I'm just wondering, what do you think 
uh, about ways that democracies around the world can be supportive, you know, supportive uh, of efforts to prevent the closing of democratic space and also the move toward authoritarianism, one in Nigeria, but maybe in other countries as well. So I'd say democracies, if for a moment can keep politics aside and take decisive actions in dealing with authoritarian governments, working together to enforce sanctions, visa bans, restrictions of government officials and their families who use our resources and your aid to enrich themselves, seizures and return of illegal assets invested in a lot of these democratic countries, support our petitions at the International Criminal Court. The Nigerian people are sick to the bone and have gone beyond demands now, but need accountability. We all know the United States is a leader in the promotion of democracy and stands by democratically minded people um, seeking democracy and the rule of law. Now, this is, of course, very critical in my country and around the world. I'd like, like to ask you, in what other ways beyond issuing statements and giving aid can the United States do more to build local partners and press African leaders to advance democracy in our countries? Well, I think that it's very important that the United States continue either directly or through the National Endowment for Democracy, continue to support, to support democratic forces around the world. People that are striving uh, to make their countries more democratic are striving against authoritarianism. It's important for us not to just uh, make statements but to back it up with resources. And then I also think, you know, where countries are willing to provide um, technical assistance, especially if it means, you know, shoring up the judiciary branch or shoring up even the security uh, in countries so that it is not corrupt. Activists like myself have been at the front lines in the fight for democracy, human rights, equality. And many of us have been killed uh, arrested or have fled our home countries. Mm -hmm. In my personal journey, there was a period of 11 months where I was locked in a house alone while waiting for help or to be evacuated. I know how difficult it is for many human rights defenders to get immediate help. How can the United States facilitate a quicker response time to activists and artists at risk? It's very important for the U.S. to have relationships that are close to the ground, close to the ground, meaning that those people that are fighting for human rights uh, actively and that being close to the ground will allow us to know when a situation has deteriorated, when leaders have been arrested, are detained, and we need to act accordingly. We need to act formally in terms of the governments that are detaining or holding someone. I will tell you that my experience in Congress has been when we speak up, even in a minor way, like sending a, a tweet that we know someone is being detained and we're naming them and we're saying they need to be released, we have found that to be uh, effective. But I think that having those relationships and being willing to name someone that is being, uh, you know, that is under uh, duress is important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those conversations. Let me turn now to NED board member, Ambassador Ruben Brigetti for our, the next part of our conversation. Thank you, Jody. Good afternoon. My name is Ruben Brigetti and I'm pleased to serve on the NED board of directors and to join you for our event ahead of the Summit for Democracy. Here, we hope to hear and learn from the experiences and expertise of former political leaders who had an opportunity to serve in government after a political opening in their countries. It's a truly remarkable set of individuals, including former president of East Timor, Jose Ramos Horta, former president of Chile, Ricardo Lagos, former foreign minister of Mali, Kamisa Kamara, and former prime minister of Slovakia, Miklos Zurinda. We had an opportunity to speak with them ahead of our event today and pull together responses to two questions. The first, to share the biggest challenges to sustaining democratic momentum when they took office. The challenges that uh, we elected leaders uh, of a society, of a country, of a people who have uh, gone through uh, generations, years of hardship, hardship resulting from uh, failed policies, 
of the past, which led precisely to these conflicts, is to heal the wounds of the people, the wounds of the body, of the soul, uh, honor the victims, but at the same time, look forward, not allowing ourselves to be hostages of the tragedies of the past. Always remembering the mistakes of the past, but always also remembering the sacrifices, the courage, the tenacity of those who fought on against all extraordinary odds to bring democracy, freedom of where it did not exist or where it existed before, but was usurped by uh, dictators. Peace, freedom, democracy, dividends. These are not abstract concepts for people living in the slums on the periphery of the privileges of the few. We must give them clean water, electricity, jobs, employment for the youth, better education, healthcare access. These are some of the challenges. Without delivering on these challenges, these minimum expectations, we are not delivering the peace and democracy dividends we fail. Here you have the two sides fighting. Torture, these people here being tortured disappear everything as a dictator used to do. But let me tell you that our transition means only that the commander in chief of the second police finished his days in prison. Yes, I know it was a very special prison. Yes, but was in prison. We were able to do that. We were able, in my turn, to produce a report on all those that has been tortured. What kind of torture? How many people was tortured? And that is the report. This size, more than 30,000 people declared themselves, we are going to find the truth. That we can do that. We cannot make justice. Justice is has to be made in the tribunal. I worked for a president who won um, a democratic election with over 77% of the votes in Mali. And so the, it was a landslide victory, obviously, and the expectations of him and his government were extremely, extremely high. And so I joined the government as Mali was um, facing an ongoing security crisis. We had a peace process uh, underway. Uh, we had uh, some economic difficulties, but at the same time, again, the expectations from, from the citizens were extremely high. And so transitioning from the civic space to the government space was a very humbling experience because I quickly realized that um, I guess when you are on the ground and when you're expecting to deliver and you're accountable to uh, millions of citizens, the stakes are different and um, it, it's not that easy. Um, so it was a very humbling experience and sustaining democratic momentum was, um, was even more difficult. Um, it's the accountability accountability part that was uh, quite challenging uh, for me personally, um, waking up every day thinking that I, was, I wasn't accountable to um, my social media followers anymore uh, as someone who was in the civic space, but I was accountable to actual human citizens who were looking up to me as somebody who could solve their daily lives. And that was again, a very, very humbling experience. The biggest challenge I found at the time was the question whether I'm able to find courage, strength, and strong will to promote real leadership based on three A, action, activity, and concrete achievements. You know, uh, the transitional period uh, was devoted to the elimination of fundamental distortions or disproportions from the past. I mean, a rectification of uh, injustice, 
rehabilitation of persons persecuted by the totalitarian regime, but also creation of uh, democratic institutions. Last but not least, adoption of rules necessary for, pre, for free market economy. In other words, the goal of the tra transition was to establish the pitch, the playing field of the next democratic development, economic and societal modernization and integration into international organization. You remember very well, OECD, NATO, the European Union. So my role and the role of my government was to play a gay, game, let me say, to play a game leading to better life of the population. In practice, it meant the necessity to promote a lot of reforms, a lot of reforms, economic reform, reforms in social area, pension reform, healthcare, uh, healthcare reform, and, uh, and uh, many others. If you want to promote reforms, you need first to have a vision. Then you need people able to prepare projects, concrete reforms. And then you need a real political leadership. I was blessed at that time because I had been accompanied by many fantastic people. I uh, try to remind you that we uh, uh, were not only privatizing of whole industries, but we were able also to adopt flat tax rate for our businesses, for our people. So we were able to create business friendly environment. While their experiences drew on different parts of the world and times, it was remarkable to hear common themes of transitional justice, delivering reforms and results, and managing multiple crises. Second, we asked them what advice they might have for civic leaders and activists today, especially those who may be reluctant to be engaged in government or political parties. Well, I would say there is no better alternative to democracy to participatory democracy, as imperfect as democracies may be in countries across the globe. We need young leaders, but we also need technocrats. We need civil society to build a responsive democracy that not only respects and promotes freedoms, but also serves citizen needs. If you are not joining the political field, if you are not joining the game of democracy, the fight of democracy, you leave the field open to demagogues, to opportunists, to dishonest people. So we need uh, some people from civil society to get involved in government, political parties, to push reforms and to build a functioning democracy by designing and implementing policies while others in civil society provide expertise to political process or sometimes put necessary pressure on government and politicians to advance reforms. What kind of politics during the next 30 years are going to be? And I think that these new institutions have to be taken into account in order to make democracy work. And democracy work when the president or whatever is, the, is listening to their demands. Staying true to your personal values when you enter politics and government is an everyday struggle. Um, but it is possible um, if you have a clear compass in, in your head and in your, mind, in your mind about what you are willing to do to get to your goals and what you're not willing to do to get to your goals. I entered government uh, three years ago, right? Um, and I was uh, quite naive about how I was perceived um, uh, as, a, as a young woman coming from the diaspora who had spent her entire professional life in the United States and who was just uh, uh, you know, coming literally out of nowhere in, in, in Mali. And uh, 
I was I was driven by results and I knew I had this the trust of the the president so I didn't think about you know how people were actually looking at me and I was just you know focused on my on my objectives and on my results I think women have a different experience um, going into politics because they are often judged on on their looks um, and um, and it can be a challenge but really my my advice to all of the women um, who want to engage in, into politics is to just not care and just do what they were um, what they they were interested to do uh, public activism or NGO activities and politics are very close to each other there is only one difference but a very significant one, a willingness and ability to take responsibility. Public activists, similarly as politicians, talk to people. They are coming up with uh, their suggestions and proposals, how to change things, how to promote, promote reforms, how to do life better than before. Both groups can influence political decision-making, but at the end of the day, it is only politics through which one can make a decision and provide people with a real change. I'm John Glenn, Senior Director at the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. What a terrific program today. At a moment when the global challenges to democracy seem even more daunting, I hope you found it as energizing as I did. See the breadth and diversity of the democratic community show up in common cause. Our speakers today, Nobel Prize winners, civic activists from around the world, former secretaries of state, Democrats and Republicans in Congress, business, labor, and former presidents and ministers come together as part of the NED family, as grantees, partners, and board members. I left the conversation convinced that we can be sober about the challenges we face as democracies and that we are truly in this struggle together. And I'd like to thank my amazing colleagues in its programs and government relations and public affairs team for engaging their network and skills to make this possible. This powerful global civil society network at the heart of NED's mission is joined with our ability to bring the power of ideas. Throughout the event, I heard insights on issues where the NED has expertise, combating modern authoritarian influence, defending the integrity of the information space, transnational kleptocracy, and emerging tech and democracy, issues that are central to today's democracy challenge. I recommend you check out the NED Forum's new Sharp Power Research Portal at sharppower.org, which has an interactive map and hundreds of examples that show the scale of this global challenge. As Damon said earlier, we view this event as the launch of a campaign to renew democratic momentum and part of a coming year of action Let's make this real, hold ourselves and governments accountable and drive progress against the very real challenges we and many of our closest partners face every day around the world. Thank you.